Well, good morning again, um, especially to those of you who might be listening online or you're going to watch this at some point in the future. Um, my name's Andrew. If we haven't met before or you missed the introduction, um, I think probably you did. Um, so welcome, just the same. Now, uh, last night uh, there was a special event that was held called Light the Night. And Light the Night is an initiative of the Leukaemia Foundation Australia. And the aim is to raise awareness and money for the research into and treatment of blood cancer. And the goal is, or the goal at least of the Leukaemia Foundation is that um, no lives would be lost to blood cancer. So Light the Night is particularly dear to my heart because um, my own father died in 2017 from the blood cancer multiple myeloma. And though he trusted Jesus Christ for his life beyond the grave, it was a very awful thing um, to watch. And that suffering was a terrible thing. So I'm really, really glad to raise money and raise awareness so that other people might not suffer. Um, but the goal that no life would be lost to blood cancer, it's a noble goal, isn't it? But I think it's something that really lies beyond us as human beings, but in light of what we've read in the passage this morning, eternal life, no life lost, is something that actually is within God's power and something that Jesus has come um, to achieve. Now, as I mentioned earlier, just in a, a moment ago, as Glenn and I um, spoke, as Glenn interviewed me, I'm currently working as a funeral director's assistant. And that job is more on the operational side of the funeral industry. So at the moment, my days are filled with transferring people from where they've died back to our facility and taking them then from our facility once they've been prepared to their funeral uh, and their final resting place, whether that's going to be burial or cremation. So I'm daily in the midst of grief and death. And I regularly sit um, at the back of a funeral, actually pressing the buttons for the AV, um, listening to what people say um, about the, their, their deceased relative. And I sit there and I observe the coffin with the deceased person in it. And the tears and the sadness of the family really caused me to think. And, and this is my big thought. Humans need a revolution that overthrows death. Don't we? We absolutely need a revolution that overthrows death. And I reflect on the elephant in the room because it's the coffin and the deceased person in that coffin. We so wish that there was a revolution because the tears and the sadness at the separation that has just occurred because of the death of that person makes it evident that we want things to be different. Otherwise, they'd be rejoicing or they'd just be indifference. But there's not. There's sadness and there's grief. We want someone or something who would overthrow death. Someone that defeats death. So here is the very good news for us today. For those of us who live in the world, who live and breathe and one day must face death ourselves. God's revolt against death has come through Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus is God's powerful, holy son. He came to overthrow Satan and so overthrow death. Because Satan is the one who is throwing at us the temptation to self-manage and reject God's rule and therefore take the consequences for that rejection of God, death and judgment that comes as a result. But Jesus has overthrown that and so he has the power to reunite people with God, giving them life forever. So hallelujah, what a great thing. So our future is not the tears of a funeral or the crush of our own death, even though that will be a difficult thing to face if my experience of my father's own death is anything to go by. But instead, our future is full of the hope of life forever with God because of Jesus Christ. And would you join me now and let's pray again because we need God's help by his Holy Spirit to understand his word now together. So please do bow your heads and let's pray. Um, Father God, please open our eyes by your spirit now, we ask. Help us to see what the demons saw, that Jesus of Nazareth is your Holy One, your King, your Messiah, our King, our Messiah. So help him, or help us, Father, let him be our King this morning. 
and in the days to come so that we might be welcomed into his kingdom as we trust him in our place. And we ask it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to work through the passage this morning and I'm going to make four points. And the first point is that God's revolution comes through Jesus' revolutionary teaching. And in that teaching, we see, we understand that Jesus is more powerful than the demons. So would you glance back down, please, at Mark chapter 21? And we're just going to read that um, quickly again together. I'm going to read from verse 21. So please do follow along in your own Bible. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, and I'm just going to take a step back from the mic for this. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Because I don't think he would have said that in a whisper. Be quiet. There you go. There's an indication that the man was uh, speaking reasonably loudly and the things that he said um, weren't what Jesus would allow him to keep saying. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. So Jesus teaches with authority and this is is the beginning of the revolution. Um, We know from Mark chapter 1 verses 14 to 15 that that we heard um, just at the beginning of our meeting time today that Jesus was definitive and certain. Because in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, we hear Jesus say words like this, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come. So this contrasts with the rabbis or or the teachers of God's law of Jesus' day because when asked a question, typically the rabbis would refer to the teaching of other rabbis. That is, they would say, say, well, Rabbi Hillel, or Rabbi such and such said this about your question. And they would deflect and try and maybe piece together their understanding through other people's teaching. But Jesus teaches with authority. He says it himself and he says this is definitive. And so the key to this revolution, this overthrow of death, is Jesus' own authoritative teaching. That's what provokes Satan's worker to react. So first, through the reaction of the demon, we see that Jesus' teaching reveals who he is. The demon says, yep, Jesus is from the humble town of Nazareth. So he's referred to as Jesus of Nazareth. Yet the demon knows what his teaching shows. Jesus is the Holy One of God. And notice there's a contrast here because the demon has been described as a man with an impure spirit. But the demon says about Jesus, he is the Holy One of God. So we have this contrast already laid out in the scream of the demon. And in the reaction of the demon, we understand in front of this authoritative figure and this authoritative teaching that is Jesus, holiness and impurity cannot coexist. There's a battle that goes down when those two things get close to each other. And here it is. Here's the reaction of Satan screaming at Jesus, God's Holy One. So that's the first thing we understand about Jesus' authority, who he is. But the second thing is, we understand that through Jesus' teaching, he will change the state of affairs of the world. So let's reflect for a moment. Because do you realise Jesus is just saying words? He is just speaking these things out. 
But when this God man says these words, everything changes. Nothing can stay the same now. Because when Jesus preaches, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come, repent and believe the good news, the true state of the world is revealed. And here it is. Satan is in opposition to God. When Jesus says that he is the king of this kingdom and he's pronouncing this good news, there can only be one king and, and Satan rears up his ugly head immediately and wants a fight. We also see that his agents oppose God's king, the Holy One. We see the reality that some people are actually possessed by Satan's power. And we see that everybody else is influenced by him as they oppose God. Because you see, as the demon screams out at Jesus and makes it so obvious that Satan hates the Son of God, people who don't let Jesus be king line up on Satan's side, not on God's side. But when Jesus preaches, the world does not stay the same. Everything changes. His opponents rise up, they scream at him, and they are defeated. And Satan's captives are free to know God. And we see that in verses 25 and 26. Glance back down, Mark chapter 1, 25 and 26. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. I like what Ben did before in the kids' talk. Um, I think I wouldn't mind that too. If I could just speak a word and the house would be clean, everything would be tidy. But here we have this brilliant example, which we'll see again in the healing of the leper and in other moments. Jesus just simply speaks a word. And he shows that he is more powerful than Satan. He is more powerful than demons. And we see that God's intention is that people would not be destroyed. Isn't it a beautiful moment that the man is actually free of this demon possession as Jesus commands the demon to come out? God loves people. He has in his heart their good and their dispossession and their freedom and their liberation. So here's a, just a point of application before we move to the second point. It's quite obvious, isn't it, that there's an implication here that people should listen to the voice of God in Jesus Christ. Because the, the demon has no choice. But the people sitting there and listening at that point, they have a choice. And so do we this morning, actually, whether we will listen to God's voice in Jesus or not. So you would be crazy to do anything else, wouldn't you? I think that's the implication. You would be silly to not listen to God's voice in Christ. But at the same time, you, you would tell his kingdom news, wouldn't you? And again, we'll see that in the leper. He just couldn't keep his mouth shut. Glenn reflected on that before. I, I, I like that. You would tell his kingdom news, wouldn't you? And exactly that's what the people do. They're so amazed and they ask each other, what, what is this? And verse 28, news about him just spread so quickly. Of course. Of course. You don't have to wait for the newspaper to come out because people are just talking, 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 talking. So there's an application for us to consider, to speak out the power of Jesus and to make sure that our conversation is about him. So in this revolution, in this overthrow, the first thing that we see is that it comes about through Jesus' authoritative teaching. But the second point I wanted to make, and the second thing we see, is that this new revolution, this power over death, comes through Jesus' healing, Jesus' revolutionary healing. We see that Jesus is more potent than the fever. So I'm thinking here of verses 29 to 34. Do you want to glance back down at that? Mark chapter 1, verses 29 to 34. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. These are, these are some of the first disciples, some of the people that Jesus has called to follow him and be his co-workers under him. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever and they immediately told Jesus about her. So obviously someone's favourable to this mother-in-law because they haven't left her in bed with a fever. So that's quite a big thing right there and then, I think. So the relationship within the family was still reasonably positive. Verse 31. So Jesus went to her, took her hand and helped her up. The fever left her and she began to wait on them. Jesus heals. 
he overpowers the power of death. So fever was certainly a killer before the discovery of penicillin. The Romans themselves had three temples dedicated um, to the gods of fever and they would make sure that amulets were placed there to placate the deity so fever would not come because it seemed to be considered as being an unnatural heat and a sign of spiritual cursing. So the fever was something that was, was considered to be evil. And even in our experience, it's very, cute, very interesting actually being in Italy for 11 years because you could have a temperature in Italy as high as you liked, 41 or 42, but the, the Italians would not care about that unless you manifested the signs of fever, um, that you sweated and uh, that you were obviously um, full of fever, and that's when they would give you sympathy. But your, your temperature could be through the roof, but unless you had the fever, they wouldn't care less. And I reckon it's a hangover of this ancient thing. And fever still is a problem. Without Panadol, without Nurofen, we are really in deep trouble when we have fever. But Jesus' power overthrows illness. Have a look at verse 31. So he went to her, took her hand and helped her up. The fever left her and she began to wait on them. He simply takes her hand helps her up, banishes her illness. No pills, no potions, no spells, no visits to any temple, no rituals. He physically elevates the woman back on her feet and Jesus not only restores her life, but he elevates her status and worth. It's a, it's a very important, beautiful moment. Her health and well-being are important in God's kingdom. A woman's life is worth as much as that of a man. It's very important. The world is a broken place, isn't it? And I, I love the comfort of the truth of the Bible um, with that message because it says to me the difficulties that I experience in my life and the trouble that we have in this world is the way it is. And it started as the consequence of Adam and Eve's sin. They sinned and we all live with the consequences. Now just have a look now at Genesis 3, 16 to 19. And this is the moment after Adam and Eve have decided to be the self-managers of the garden and reject God's leadership. And this is the consequence because um, there can only be one God and God remains that. And, and he says, here are the consequences, the curses for your decision to live in my place. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labour, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. So you can see there just in the, in the physicality of being a woman, doing the thing that is very natural and that God designed women to do, there will be pain. And there will be pain in relationship because um, the desire of a woman to perhaps rule over her husband will be very great and that's going to cause grief. To Adam he said, because you listened to your wife, and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you. And I think the point is there that he didn't keep God's word to be the highest word over him. <coughs> you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground since from it you were taken for dust you are and to dust you will return. There's a competition between God and people. There's a competition between people and people. There's a competition between people and the very ground that they walk on, that they're trying to work. This life is wrecked because of the consequence of Adam's sin that we all inherit. The world needs healing. People need healing. We need a revolution. And the worldwide pharmaceutical industry industry which is worth about 1.4 trillion dollars according to my very brief google search it testifies to that fact we're all searching for healing the covid vaccine there's a race for it isn't there we need to be healed we need to be protected this world is a world that is constantly under threat and we're fighting off death every day but here's what jesus shows in this moment he shows that the revolution has come he is the revolutionary who brings healing. Demons and sickness are part of Satan's rule. But Jesus has come to show God is boss and to bring the healing that
that God originally intended for Adam and Eve in the garden to live in perfect relationship with him, with each other, and with the creation. God's desire is that people are healed and restored to know him, to love him, and to serve him as their king. And the mother-in-law's example is so important because what does she do as soon as she's healed? She gets up and she serves. She serves. So at at this point, I I just wanted to stop and reflect on the thing that I mentioned earlier. Um, So it's become clear to me that it's not just kind of advertising on the side of a bus for cosmetic surgery um, that is something that maybe is, is, something, is a thing in our society. It's actually that um, self-image, time in the gym, cosmetic surgery, it really, really has a growing place in our world because people are, in, in some cases, concerned for their health and want to be treated for that, but in other cases, they're just so preoccupied with themselves. It's all about them even to the point of withdrawing superannuation during the COVID crisis to pay for breast enhancement, which is something that um, someone shared with me recently, Um, a cosmetic surgeon, a plastic surgeon. This is his experience in recent days. But by contrast, the mother-in-law shows that when God's purposes are being fulfilled in a person's life, they realise that they've been created to be known by God, to be restored by God, to be loved by God, and to serve God's King, the Lord Jesus, who brings that revolutionary healing. That's my second point. What we're seeing here is God's overthrow of death through Jesus' authoritative teaching, through Jesus' revolutionary healing, And we see that the source of Jesus' power in this revolution is God himself. This is my third point. Do you want to have a glance back down at Mark chapter 1 from verse 35? And we hear this. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he travelled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Prayer is simply trusting in God's power, but it's a beautiful act, actually, of saying, I don't have the power, Lord, but you do. Because when we pray, we recall God's powerful acting in history up to that point. And we call upon God's power to act in the present and in the future, but according to his will, not ours. Um, So Jesus taught in a very famous prayer um, about some of these things. I wanted to have a look at that with you just really briefly. And you'll find this in Matthew chapter 6. But when his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray, he said... This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it actually is currently in heaven. You please give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. There's so much to say about that prayer. Uh, I'd love to talk more about it. I don't have the time right now. But we see, don't we, that prayer acknowledges who God is. We acknowledge that power comes from him to live his way, to have what we need, to bless him and bless others, actually, which is his desire. God is the source of Jesus' revolutionary prayer. Because if Jesus would teach this to his disciples, you can be certain that he was already praying this prayer. But I take it that he's also praying for power to preach. Because while the crowds might want miracles, Jesus knows Satan will scream and squirm at the good news that is preached. So remember Mark chapter 1 verses 14 to 15 here. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So this is the news of Satan's overthrow. And God's victory, calling people to come and have life, not death. 
And Jesus' teaches, teaching announces that victory because God's King, Jesus himself, has come. His healing demonstrates it. This is the revolution that overthrows Satan and brings freedom and life to people. So just a quick point of application before I go on to my fourth and final point. Prayer. Jesus wasn't acting in his own power. He was drawing on his Father's strength. So it's a wonderful indicator to us, isn't it? Because also the disciples who became the first apostles, the ones who were sent out following Jesus' resurrection, on that first, the freedom to approach and worship God together with other people. That would have been ecstasy. That's what Jesus has come to make possible. And we see in this moment that Jesus is more infectious than the disease. That's not my line, that's from the Mark drama. So I won't claim credit for that. I'll point you in the direction of the Mark drama if you've never heard of that. And I think Ben made that really, really clear before in the kids' talk. Something that no one else would have ever done. Something, in fact, that people were forbidden to do because if they had touched the leper, they themselves would have been ceremonially unclean and they wouldn't have been able to participate in the worshipping life of God's people. Jesus is more infectious than the disease. He touches the leper... He cleans him to satisfy God's law, showing that he really can do this and that he wants to do this so that God and people can be united in holiness, wellness and worship. And so that's why Jesus will say to the man, go and show the priest. Because what's just happened is the fulfilment of God's law in an extremely miraculous way. There's a second point to it as well, I think, because the priests and the teachers of the law need to understand that Jesus really is God's son. Jesus really is the Messiah that they have been waiting for. And also because it, it's not time yet to start preaching. And I think that is why he says to, to the man who's just been healed, don't go, and, don't go and speak it out because you really don't have the full picture yet. The preaching really will start once Jesus is risen. And we see that really in the experience of the closest disciples as they keep travelling with Jesus and they even rebuke Jesus for talking about his death and his coming resurrection. They don't have the full picture yet. The real preaching will start then and that's when it will be really switched on. But of course, how could you keep it in? How could you? You just couldn't. Our healing... And a restoration. That's exactly what God wants for people everywhere. But here's the significance of the leper for us. The leper is the hard edge of exclusion from God's presence. Excuse the pun, but the leper cannot change his spots. He cannot do it by himself. Now the leper shows very clearly on the outside exactly how all of us are on the inside. I like that point that Ben, ben made previously in the kids talk. We are unclean. We are impure. We line up more with Satan and his minions because we like to govern ourselves and we like to say to God, no, we don't want your rule over us. And as the psalmist says, and Paul picks up in Romans chapter 3, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. We all oppose God. We all need cleansing from our sin. And so be enabled to come into God's presence. Now what I've just said is extremely unpopular because my experience uh, back in the working world for a little while has reminded me that not only through funerals but also through conversations with my colleagues that people think that good is good enough for God and that we are the ones who basically determine what is good. <laughs> so do you see what happens there? We basically put ourselves in God's place because we say what's okay. But no matter the goodness of the leper, he needed healing and his impurity is a picture of our condition. He's wrestling with Satan within and he's sick on the outside. Neither of those things is acceptable to God. And that's why Jesus will say to all people, repent and believe the good news because we all need to turn back to God. We all need to trust Jesus as our Lord and Saviour. And that is exactly what Jesus came for and that's what he became 
So just really in the, in the conclusion right now, we do have the fuller picture. The leper was uh, commanded not to speak it out. But we now live in the era, the day when we can speak it out because we have the full picture. Jesus was walking a road to the cross where he would put himself in our place as the perfect sacrifice, that perfect substitute, his righteousness and his rightness with God for our unrighteousness and make that swap. The revolution had its finest hour at the cross of Christ. And that's now good news for all people, no matter where we come from, no matter how we grew up, that's good news for all of us. So those who heard Jesus teach were amazed. The woman who was healed, she served him. The leper couldn't keep his mouth shut about Jesus. But here's the implication for us. What do we do? How do we respond? How do we accept it? And how do we go forward? now that the overthrow of death is complete. Well, I started by referring to Light the Night, which is an excellent initiative of the Leukaemia Foundation, but it's not the solution. It's a good thing to be involved in. And I started thinking with you also about my experience as a funeral director's assistant and sitting in funeral after funeral and being immersed in the grief and the sadness of people at the loss of their loved one, longing for heaven and life beyond the grave. But making up our own ideas is not the solution. Jesus has overpowered death. So what we need to do is let him lead us, let him have the victory for us as we trust him, and enjoy that. Be glad, rejoice. And secondly, speak it out. Speak it out. Because if your friends and your colleagues are anything like mine, they don't know this story and they don't know Jesus. So let's go forward into this week just being clear, perhaps remembering one aspect of what we've heard this morning that we might be able to share with our friends and our colleagues when we see them tomorrow. Let's pray. Please join me and let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we're just rejoicing. We're so glad that Jesus is more powerful than the demons, that Jesus is more potent than the fever, that Jesus draws on your power, which is for our good, and that Jesus is more infectious than the disease, that he has come, Lord God, to cleanse us and take away our impurity of our sin and open the way to rejoicing and access and worship of you. We're just so thankful. So please help us um, this week, Lord, this afternoon, to, to live that lightness of being, to, to be glad, to rejoice. And also, Lord God, just to speak out one aspect of Jesus that comes through what we've heard this morning to our friends and colleagues so that they might know that good is not good enough, but your grace is enough, and that has come to us in the Lord Jesus. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>